acyl chlorides or acid chlorides contain the carbonyl group linked to a chlorine, which is a fantastic leaving group. So this carbonyl carbon is quite electrophilic, and this is characteristic of the reactivity of acyl chlorides, as we'll see in this video. To make acyl chlorides, because they are so reactive, is actually a little bit tricky. We can't make them through a straightforward nucleophilic acyl substitution process because chloride is just too weak of a nucleophile to engage with esters, amides, or any other type of carboxylic acid derivative. The exception is carboxylic acids under the influence of this reagent, SOCl2, or thionyl chloride. The basic idea here, and the reason a carboxylic acid in particular works, is that we can transform the OH group into a good leaving group mechanistically. So an intermediate is going to get generated here in which we have a leaving group that's even better than chloride, that can depart irreversibly when chloride adds in leaving the acyl chloride product. So this occurs through coordination of the carbonyl oxygen to sulfur with displacement of chloride, followed by a nucleophilic addition of the chloride into the carbonyl carbon. Notice this makes the carbon-chlorine bond. This is a key step, this nucleophilic addition. And we have a kind of tetrahedral intermediate here. This tetrahedral intermediate can eliminate off this leaving group right here. And ultimately we get SO2, which is a gas, and Cl- as the byproducts here. And in the final step of the mechanism, a base removes the proton from the carbonyl oxygen, and we end up with the acyl chloride. So this is all centered on turning that OH group and the carboxylic acid ultimately into a good leaving group, and the, the ultimate things that leave are SO2, which is again a gas, and a chloride anion from SOCl2. So this is how we make acyl chlorides from carboxylic acids. To begin to discuss the reactivity of acyl chlorides, we'd be remiss if we didn't start with hydrolysis, which is an extremely favorable process for acyl chlorides, so favorable that even in the open air, even with water vapor in the air, acyl chlorides can hydrolyze and form carboxylic acids. So the reaction converts an acyl chloride into a carboxylic acid, and it's a nucleophilic acyl substitution with water as the nucleophile. Chloride is such an awesome leaving group that this can occur readily, and the byproducts here are H3O plus and Cl minus. You generally never run this reaction on purpose because we just saw that you can make acyl chlorides from carboxylic acids, but it is a good opportunity to practice sort of the canonical mechanism of nucleophilic acyl substitution. So in this reaction, that carbonyl carbon is so electrophilic that water can add to it directly, ending, uh, getting us to this Zwitter ionic intermediate that you see here. This can then eliminate chloride very rapidly to give essentially the protonated product Proton is removed, and we end up with a neutral carboxylic acid when this is all said and done. And the byproducts, notice, are the chloride that was eliminated in this beta elimination step, and H3O+, which was generated in this deprotonation step. So not only does hydrolysis of acyl chlorides generate a carboxylic acid, but HCl, hydrochloric acid, is also generated at the same time. And we can observe this, for example, as a pH increase if we put an acyl chloride a pH decrease, rather, if we put an acyl chloride in water. Acyl chlorides are so electrophilic that they can react readily with almost any nucleophile you can think of. Any even remotely reactive nucleophile, even something as weak as water, can react readily with an acyl chloride. Often, when we deliberately want to react a nucleophile with an acyl chloride to get some other carboxylic acid derivative, we add in a base to sort of mop up the hydrochloric acid that's going to be generated in this reaction, and quite often the base of choice is pyridine here. Sometimes, particularly for making amides, we can use an extra equivalent of the amine nucleophile to act as a base, something like HNR2 in general. And this sequesters hydrochloric acid, just like in the hydrolysis case we saw in the last slide, HCl is generated. And if we don't have a base around to sort of mop up that HCl, the H3O plus that's generated could do problematic things, problematic proton transfers, right? So here in all three of these examples, pyridine base is used to sort of sequester HCl. And the, the H in the pyridinium ion comes from the nucleophile, which is neutral in all three cases. And the Cl minus comes from the uh, acyl chloride. It's a leaving group, right? Okay, the typical mechanism in these reactions is generally some combination of nucleophilic addition 
beta elimination of chloride and then a proton transfer off of the nucleophilic atom. And this may not be the order of events, so to speak. The nucleophile may get protonated first. For example, that's likely if we put a carboxylic acid together with pyridine, we're likely to get quite a bit of carboxylate. But these three steps need to occur to get us from the starting acyl chloride to the final product, which is some other carboxylic acid derivative. So notice here in the first reaction, we're taking an acyl chloride and we're treating it with a carboxylic acid, which is nucleophilic at these carboxyl oxygens. The resulting product is an anhydride, and this occurs via nucleophilic substitution by the carboxyl or carboxylate oxygen built into the carboxylic acid. So anhydrides can be made favorably from acyl chlorides. Esters can also be made favorably from acyl chlorides. If we take the acyl chloride, we treat with an alcohol nucleophile now, still using pyridine base. Notice that a nucleophilic substitution has occurred. OR2 has essentially displaced Cl, and the resulting structure is an ester. Finally, if we take an acyl chloride and we treat with an amine, and here we can just use two equivalents of a primary or secondary amine, we end up with an amide product here. And this is again a nucleophilic acyl substitution with the amino nucleophile displacing chloride to generate the amide product. And here I've gone through and just highlighted the nucleophilic atom in red, the electrophilic carbonyl carbon in blue, and the leaving group, chlorine, in each of these reactions. Just to emphasize, these are all nucleophilic substitutions occurring at an electrophilic acyl carbon. They're all SNAC reactions. The mechanisms can get a little bit tricky because the acyl chloride is actually a really, really good electrophile. It's possible for the base to actually add in and displace chloride before our desired nucleophile ever gets involved. The result when pyridine is the base are these acyl pyridinium intermediates. And we can think of this as catalysis by the pyridine as a Lewis base rather than a Bronsted base, where the pyridine is adding in as a nucleophile or Lewis base, right, to facilitate the reaction. You don't need to know too many of the details here. I only mention this because if you dig into the mechanistic literature behind these reactions of acyl chlorides, you'll find a lot of evidence for Lewis base catalysis in many cases. However, for our purposes, it's completely fine to keep in mind this idea that nucleophilic addition, beta elimination, and proton transfer are the three key steps that need to occur in these reactions. Acyl chlorides are highly oxidized, and even though technically the carbonyl carbon is in the oxidation state plus 3, I tend to kind of think of it, about it as plus 3.5, quote-unquote, because the chlorine is so withdrawing and such a great leaving group that that carbonyl carbon is very electron deficient relative to something like an ester or an amide. And so they're highly amenable because they are so oxidized, they're amenable to reduction. And so this slide surveys some reductive reactions of acyl chlorides in which the product is more reduced than the starting acyl chloride. So for example, we can treat an acyl chloride with lithium aluminum hydride, a very strong reducing agent. This is an extremely favorable reaction because we've got a very electrophilic substrate reacting with a very nucleophilic reagent. Recall here that LiAlH4 supplies nucleophilic hydrogen, H minus, quote unquote, and like a carboxylic acid and ester, which we've seen in another context, a double addition occurs here to give a primary alcohol, and this reaction occurs via an aldehyde intermediate. So there's a substitution of H- minus for Cl- minus that occurs, and then hydride adds to this that resulting aldehyde intermediate to give the primary alcohol product. So lithium aluminum hydride will reduce acyl chlorides all the way down to the primary alcohol. If we hit an acyl chloride with a Grignard reagent, something similar occurs, but our nucleophile is now not H minus, but R minus, quote unquote, right? Now the R group linked to MGX in the Grignard reagent is nucleophilic, and this occurs via a ketone intermediate. So R2 minus, quote, quote unquote, substitutes for Cl minus. This generates this ketone intermediate right here. And that ketone is, of course, amenable to reaction with the Grignard reagent. And the result is a tertiary alcohol with two copies of that nucleophilic R2 group built into the product. So just like we got two H's up here, we end up with two R groups down here in the reaction of a Grignard reagent with an acyl chloride. 
If you use a milder organometallic reagent with not so much negative charge built onto the organic groups, like a lithium organocuprate, then the, you can get the reaction to stop at the ketone stage. So this converts the acyl chloride into a ketone with only one R2 group added. Ultimately, R2 minus has substituted for Cl minus, and this will not react further um, because the lithium organocuprate is a relatively mild reagent. Just to say one last thing about these reagents, one of the reasons they're so mild is copper is pretty far to the right in the transition series, right? So it's pretty electronegative, and there's actually formal negative charge on the copper. If we split this out based on um, the ions, it's R2, 2, Cu minus, and Li plus. And so there's negative charge, at least formally, on the copper atom, and, and it's at least somewhat okay with that because of the electronegativity of copper. So these are milder organometallic reagents than, for example, organolithiums or Grignards, in which there's a great deal of negative charge on the organic group. If we want to reduce the acyl chloride not all the way down to a primary alcohol but to an aldehyde, that's possible using a complex metal hydride reagent that is less reactive than lithium aluminum hydride. And the one of choice is lithium aluminum tritertbutoxy hydride, where three OTBU groups, three tertbutoxy groups right here, replace three of the hydrogens in lithium aluminum hydride. And this achieves partial reduction to the aldehyde. So the acyl chloride is converted to the aldehyde and the reaction stops there. And the reason this reagent is less reactive than lithium aluminum hydride has to do with the electronegative oxygen atoms pulling a lot of the negative charge toward themselves such that the hydrogen built into this reagent is less nucleophilic. Right, there's less negative charge on that hydrogen, so it's less inclined to add as a nucleophile or react as a nucleophile with carbonyl compounds, thanks to these electronegative oxygen atoms. And we can see the polarization of those bonds toward the oxygens, such that the oxygens have most of the negative charge that's built into this anion right here. All right, so that's one option for converting an acyl chloride into an aldehyde. Another option involves conversion of the acyl chloride into an ester, and then treatment with Dibal-H, which is a reagent that can partially reduce an ester to an aldehyde. So treatment of the acyl chloride with the alcohol and pyridine, we saw that previously, is a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction that converts the acyl chloride into an ester. And then we can treat the ester with Dibal-H, and this leads to the aldehyde product. The reaction stops at the aldehyde stage. There's not a second addition of hydride here. Dibal-H is a less reactive than lithium aluminum hydride reducing agent. It's actually neutral with a neutral aluminum H bond, and that H is still quite nucleophilic, but it's not so nucleophilic that at low temperatures in particular, it reduces the aldehyde all the way to a primary alcohol. At low temperatures with Dibal-H, you can achieve partial reduction to the aldehyde and stop there. 